It's mysterious, it's deadly, and it's baffling medical science. Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. If uh, the trends continue as they are, I think we can predict that the Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome is a, is a highly fatal illness likely to remain with us for the next decade. And I've watched a great many of my friends die. It takes 15 months on the average, and they end up uh, skeletons. How many AIDS patients do you see in a week? 300 is, is, a, is an average week for us. And how many of those will end up dying? The, the mortality for the disease is close to 100%. Since its discovery in June 1981, HIV-AIDS has claimed more American lives than World War I, World War II, and the Vietnam War combined. More than 700,000 individuals. Globally, 32 million people have died from the disease. 75 million have been infected with HIV. The number of people dying and the rates of new infection have declined substantially since the early 2000s, but still remain at dangerously high levels. And to meet a severe and urgent crisis abroad tonight, I propose the emergency plan for AIDS relief. Many believe that the end of AIDS is within reach, fueled by billions of dollars that have made possible a massive expansion of antiretroviral drug therapy to over 25 million persons living with HIV, along with major innovations in prevention. Treatment itself, it was discovered, can reduce transmission to zero. Several other new technologies advance prevention, most recently pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP. These historical gains notwithstanding, the billions invested in research and development have yet to generate a vaccine or cure, the most fundamental tools in ultimately controlling the epidemic. The greatest challenge that we experience here in this county is still the stigma. People are still afraid of the disease. They're afraid of testing. They're afraid of even knowing what their status is. Lisa Brizendine coordinates care and services for those living with HIV and AIDS in Crittenden County, Arkansas. Half of the county's residents are African-American and one in five are poor. Despite having one of the highest HIV prevalence rates in the state, many of those living with HIV there struggle daily with isolation. Poverty, discrimination, homophobia, lack of housing, and mental health disorders. Some of your family members may not be accepting and may treat you differently. It may not be on purpose, but that's just how they feel. If I'm still thinking, um, you may not need to sleep in this bed or sleep on the same linen or share the same utensils. That's not a good feeling. Brizendine and her colleagues struggle to reach marginalized populations within their community with essential education before it's too late. I would say our biggest risk factor is young um, gay males. We as medical providers know that. But I will tell you, once a week, uh, I get a newly diagnosed young male and, and ask myself, you know, where was the ad campaign? Where was the knowledge that we could have provided that these patients just don't know about?
South Africa remains the epicenter of the global epidemic. Every week, 4,500 of its citizens acquire HIV. 1,500 of those are adolescent girls and young women. I'm 23 years old and I'm HIV positive. I found out that I'm HIV positive. It was 2017, uh, November 23. I was pregnant. My boyfriend was, uh, was positive, but he didn't tell me that he, he, he is positive. In some communities in South Africa's eastern province of KwaZulu-Natal, 60% of women are living with HIV. Ukraine has the second highest HIV prevalence rate in Europe. That nation's third largest city, Odessa, has the highest rate within the country. Local providers deploy mobile clinics to deliver services and supplies to key populations, including intravenous drug users and sex workers. But despite Ukraine's impressive progress, in stark contrast to Russia's escalating HIV AIDS epidemic, the latest prevention tools aren't yet available. How often do you come and, and take the services? Maybe several times a month. Has anyone approached you to, about taking PrEP, about pre-exposure? PrEP It's when PrEP PrEP. As of early 2020, only a few hundred Ukrainians in Kiev have had access to PrEP. Now, the 22nd International AIDS Conference begins in Amsterdam today amid warnings from experts that the epidemic risks coming back and spiraling out of control. Things are getting worse. In Eastern Europe and Central Asia, new infections have increased 30 percent since 2010. In countries around the world where infections have actually been increasing, and clearly we're no, nowhere near epidemic control if we still have incidents on the, on the rise. Following Amsterdam, many of the most prominent HIV leaders continue to sound alarm bells. I think we are in a crucial moment in the response to HIV. There's clearly complacency. If you do not continue to suppress new infections more and more, there's always the danger of the rebound. I am deeply concerned that the current trajectory of the HIV epidemic, that we may end up going backwards. We are seeing really a high risk of uh, a resurgence. I think the whole issue of complacency is something that worries us all. I do have some concern that there will be a regression in cases of HIV AIDS. I'm really worried about distraction. I think the message is that AIDS is still a problem. We were motivated to struggle because people were dying. People are still dying. It's just 
math. If we can't reduce the infection rate by 80 to 90% among young people, and they're only getting tested at a 50% rate, we will lose control of the epidemic. We're missing opportunities and we're losing time. We're not winning the war on prevention. We've, we've made progress, but it's not enough to say, let's hang up our gloves on HIV. With this epidemic, if we're not moving forwards, we are sliding back. And you know, the worry is that, yes, the moving forward may be incremental, but the slide back is gonna be rapid um, and, and devastating. If we don't stay on this course, we don't continue to fund it, we don't continue to bring the resources and the will to this agenda, we could see HIV infections return to its historical rate. And, and if that were to happen, I'm not sure we'll ever have the resources to contain it again. It was before COVID-19 when we spoke with these remarkable scientists, innovators, and providers who dedicated their lives to HIV. It was before COVID-19 when we spoke with people in Arkansas, KwaZulu-Natal, and Odessa. Those living with HIV, those at threat, and those who provide care to the dispossessed and marginalized. Those conversations revealed the central paradox surrounding HIV AIDS. Remarkable historical achievements side by side with complacency, with deep structural barriers to progress, and high risks of regression. The coronavirus's grip on the world now threatens the remarkable achievements of the past two decades in controlling HIV AIDS. If political attention is redirected, if monies are diverted, and if societies and health systems are overwhelmed. It also creates an opportunity, a new awareness of the need to invest in a sustained and strong way to prepare against pandemics. 